Kunsha Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Janabalabha Giri Paradhari Gopi Janabalabha Giri Paradhari Yaso dhanandana prajajana ranchana Yaso dhanandana prajajana ranchana Jamuna Chira Panachari Jamuna Chira Panachari Jaya Radha Madhava Punja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Punja Bihari Jaya Gopi Chana Pallapa Giri Varadhari Gopi Chana Pallapa Giri Varadhari Yaso dhanandana prachachana ranchana Yaso dhanandana prachachana ranchana Jamuna chira panachari Sapati Prataka Charja Astho Tetasita Sri Shimad, His Divine Grace, 
श्रीमद एसी भक्ति विधांत स्वामी प्रभु पाद की जय इस कान फाउंडर आचार्य श्रील प्रभु पाद की जय जय ओम विष्णु पाद परमहंस परिप्राच काचार शास्त्रो तरसत श्री श्रीमार श्रील भक्ति सिद्धांत सरस्वती ठाकुर प्रभु पाद की जय अनंति कोटि बैष्णव प्रिंड की जय नामाचार्य श्रील हरिदास ठाकुर की जय प्रेम सिकोहो श्री कृष्ण चाई तन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदार हार शिवा साधी गौर भक्त बिंद की जय श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गोप गोपी नाथ श्याम कुंद राधा कुंद किटी गोवर्धन की जय श्री पिंड पान धाम की जय श्री नवद्वीप मायापुर धाम की जय श्री जगन्नाथपुरी धाम की जय श्री मथुरा धाम की जय श्री द्वारक धाम की जय गंगा माई की जय यमुना माई की जय भक्ति देवी की जय तुलसी देवी की जय समबेर भक्त ब्रिंद की जय शिशिराधा गोपीनाथ मंदिर की जय गौर प्रेमानंदी ओ ग्लोरीज तू दिया संबंध बोलते ओ ग्लोरीज तू दिया संबंध बोलते ओ ग्लोरीज तू दिया संबंध बोलते ओ ग्लोरीज तू श्री गुरु एं श्री गोरांग भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय यदोइते संगता भावा भूतेंद्रिया मनोगुना यदायतन यद यदायतना निर्माने नासे कुर ब्रह्मवित्तमा यदोइते संगता भावा भूतेंद्रिया मनोगुना यदायथाना निर्माने नासे कुर ब्रह्मवित्तमा यदोइते संगता भावा भूतेंद्रिया मनोगुना यदायतना निर्माने नाशे कुर ब्रह्मवित्तमा
ladies. As long as, as, long as ete, ete, all these, these asangataha, without being assembled, assembled bhava, bhava, remained so situated, remained so situated bhuta, bhuta, elements, elements indriya, indriya, senses. senses Mana, Mana. Mind. mind, guna, guna. Modes, of modes of nature, yada, yada. So, long. so long, ayatana, ayatana. The, body. the body, nirmane, nirmane. In, being in being formed, na seku, na seku. was not possible. Brahmavittama, Brahma Onarda, Onarda, the best knower of transcendental knowledge. <laughs> Onarda, best of the transcendentalists, the forms of the body cannot take place as long as these created parts namely the elements, senses, mind, and modes of nature are not assembled. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Bidanda Swami Prabhupada. The different types of bodily construction of the living entities are exactly like different types of motor cars manufactured by assembling the allied motor parts. When the car is ready, the driver sits in the car and moves it as he desires. This is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, 1861. The living entity is as if seated on the machine of the body. And the car of the body is moving by the control of nature, just as the railway trains are moving under the direction of the controller. The living entities, however, are not the bodies. They are separate from the cars of the body. But the less intelligent material scientist cannot understand the process of assembling the parts of the body, namely the senses, the mind, and the qualities of the material modes. Every living entity is a spiritual spark, part and parcel of the Supreme Being. And by the kindness of the Lord, for the Father is kind to his sons, the individual living beings are given a little freedom to act according to their own will, to lord it over the material nature. Just as a father gives some playthings 
to the crying child to satisfy him, the whole material creation is made possible by the will of the Lord to allow the bewildered living entities to lord it over things as they desire, although under the control of the agent of the Lord. The living entities are exactly like small children playing the material field under the control of the maid servant of the Lord or nature. They accept the maya, the illusory energy, like maid servant, as the all in all, and thus wrongly conceive the supreme truth to be feminine, Maya, or the goddess Durga. The foolish, childlike materialists cannot reach beyond the conception of the maidservant, material nature. But the intelligent, grown-up sons of the Lord know well that all the acts of material nature are controlled by the Lord. Just as a maidservant is under the control of the master, the father of the undeveloped children, the parts of the body, such as the senses, are the creation of the Mahatattva. And when they are assembled by the will of the Lord, the material body comes into existence. And the living entity is allowed to use it for further activities. This is explained as follows. <coughs> Om Akyan Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Nididanjena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tatati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutapatakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahakana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanda Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brinda Baneshwadi Brishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hadi Priye Vanshakalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha, Atitanam Bhavanibhyo, Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasadi Gauda Bhakta Binda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Na, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Iti Namine. Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Om 
O Narada, best of the transcendentalists, the forms of the body cannot take place as long as these created parts, namely the elements, senses, mind, and modes of nature, are not assembled. We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 5, entitled, The Cause of All Causes, text 32. I am very grateful to all of you for being here today. How many attended the flower festival yesterday evening? Please raise both your hands. How many of you stayed up all night cleaning, af cleaning up after all the rest of us? Please raise your hands. <laughs> um, there's not so much glory in cleaning up. <laughs> in the eyes of God there is. One ton of flowers that were plucked by sincere devotees and then offered to Shishirata Gopinath and then a shower of flower power upon all the devotees and then many hours of devotees dancing on those flowers, kind of liquefying them, <laughs> and causing them to merge into the floor and the walls and the chandeliers and the ceiling and the hallways and the courtyards and everything. To the extent it was exciting, to that same extent, there was the service of cleaning up. <laughs> and when we have the same spirit, actually, it's an even sweeter spirit. When you're plucking the flowers, they're fresh, they're fragrant, and they're going to be offered to Krishna. But after midnight, when you're sweeping and scrubbing, those flowers have been offered to the Lord, and all the ingredients that are on the feet of the devotees are completely merged into it. Srila Prabhupada taught when we're cooking for Krishna, half of cooking is cleaning. And the way he did it personally, and I'm not saying you have to do like this, but he would cook in such a way that when he completed cooking, everything was clean. Because he would clean as he was cooking. He just, he just wouldn't leave a mess for somebody else later. Because he was saying, each pot is the property of the Lord. And Srila Prabhupada would say, the kitchen is Srimati Radharani's favorite place. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. When we understand sacred property, we honor and respect that. And that very same principle is at the very heart of 
the, prob the environmental crisis that's taking place in the world today. We're seeing the objects of God's creation simply as objects to be utilized according to our own whimsical convenience. We create so many unnecessary necessities because we're thinking, I am this body and whatever is in relation to the body is mine. When we begin in the temple, we get this perception. We establish this consciousness that this is, this is Radha Gopinath, this is God's room. What I speak here, as far as possible, what I think here, what I do here, should be with utmost respect. What to speak of on the altar or in the kitchen. But it's not that we're supposed to have this consciousness here and then go out and forget it. We come here to infuse our consciousness in such a way that when we go out, we apply that same spirit wherever we are, whoever we're with, and whatever we do, as far as possible. When we go into the forest, this is God's creation and God's children. And when we're in this jungle of Mumbai, I think there's over 20 million people that live in this city. <laughs> and it's a matter of opinion whether you think it's well organized. <laughs> <laughs> but still, everything is here is God's energy. And whatever it may be, we are supposed to have this consciousness. It's not just uh, it's not just to not exploit, but it's to reciprocate by always striving to make every situation, every place better. Because the moment that we have to do it belongs to God. This idea that nothing is mine is the most beautiful experience for the consciousness when it is understood properly. Mm -hmm. Everything is meant as an opportunity to reciprocate with the infinite grace, mercy, and love of God. And we reciprocate with our intention to love and to serve. The things around us, the people around us, the very abilities, intelligence within us, and the time, precisely every moment that we have. It's all given to us. And we have the free will to utilize it accordingly. When we come to these temples and we associate with people who inspire us spiritually and give us faith in this higher consciousness, and we perform our sadhana of hearing and chanting and praying to infuse ourselves with this awareness.
So yesterday, yes, I was, I was up quite late myself, um, and I was actually really humbled to see all the devotees just cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And it's incredible um, where flowers that were dance upon, where they may wander in the middle of the night. <laughs> and do any of you see any of them? 2,000 pounds of flowers, how many petals are they? And yeah, it's like a dream that never happened. <laughs> and actually, uh, the chandeliers were filled with flower petals. They were coming down, they were getting crushed under your feet, then they were getting thrown up in the air again, and the chandeliers were getting... And the devotees with little ladders... So what is high and what is low? What is high and low is our consciousness. Our intent, the integrity of our words and actions, in harmony with this higher principle. In this verse, Lord Brahma, who is secondary creator within the universe we live, is describing the process of creation and why to Narada Muni. And in the verse and in purport, This word assembled is used many times. That there are so many um, elements of material nature. And for anything to exist as we know it, so much has been assembled. And Srila Prabhupada is using example of cars. In India, you call them automobiles. <laughs> Anyways, when I first came to Brindaban, there was no cars. I, I can't, don't remember in all the months I lived there seeing any cars. Twice a day, a bus, a really old, bus and I never saw the bus driver ever wearing shoes or sandals or anything he was just a barefooted bus driver <laughs> and he would the bus would just go from Mathura to Brindaban bus station and then go back to Mathura once or twice a day morning evening and other than that, there were some rickshaws, but not motor rickshaws, bicycle. <clears throat> so the, the most, besides kirtan, the most obstructive noise, there was no sound systems, was just the ringing of the bells of the rickshaws. Ding, ding, people, hoes, so much disturbance. <laughs> Um, now there's huge traffic jams with so many cars. And even in those days, Bombay, we had um, ambassadors and those Marutis and only very, very wealthy people would have anything beyond that. And there weren't that many. But now so many cars. 
and so many bridges being built to accommodate, ever increasing. So Srila Prabhupada has given an example. We, we see these cars, we don't really appreciate what it takes to assemble one all the different components and elements to make it work. But there needs to be human intelligence who's engineering and putting in place all the parts. And then nothing works unless a person comes to drive it. And in the same way, the whole creation is there. What a miracle. Sometimes we're thinking overpopulation. That may be from a particular perspective. But just think, every human being, not to speak of all other species, what a miracle. They're all uniquely assembled. No two look exactly alike. No two think exactly alike. And instead of thinking 20 million people are too much, we could be thinking 20 million people in this city and everyone is absolutely unique with unique desires, with unique characteristics. Somehow or other, they're assembled. And Now we have like machines that assemble things. It used to be that human hands would assemble. By God's manufacturing supreme skill, he has nature assembling everything. A male and a female come together and there's a little child that starts to assemble. And the mother and father usually don't know what's going on. <laughs> and nobody else really does either. <laughs> this is nature. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, mayat yakshena prakriti suyate sacharachara. Nature is actually controlling everything. The nature of time. No one can escape the influence of time. The nature of the sun and the moon and all of the great blessings of Mother Earth and the air and the water that falls from the sky. This is, these are all inconceivable gifts of nature that are assembling themselves by the power of nature. And what to speak of people's instinctive natures and their cravings and fears. You don't really have to go to school to learn about those things. They're just kind of in the um, interior design of the automobile of your body and your mind. But Krishna is describing that he is the controller of nature. And how he, how he controls is so much beautifully described in our reading today that the living force that is animating everything within nature, however big or small, their bodies and their intelligence may be, everyone has free will. But according to how we use our free will, 
we don't have a choice how nature is going to respond. We have a choice if we want to eat nutritious food or um, unhealthy food. But once you eat it, you have no choice whether you're going to get healthy or sick. And actually, at every moment in this human form of life, we always have this free will, this choice. And what makes it so special is the pleasures and the pains, the conveniences and the inconveniences, the honor and the dishonor, these things are always happening within this world. We don't have much control over our environment. We have some. But if we really could control our environment, we would always be young and beautiful and happy and everyone would be loving us and appreciating everything we do and say. How many have that experience? Um, how many do not have that experience? <laughs> how many are sound, soundly sleeping at this moment? <laughs> Um, we don't have that experience. <laughs> that means we're not really in control. But we do have some control how we're going to respond. Are we going to grow through this experience or are we going to further implicate myself in the complexities of material bondage through this experience? And according to Srimad Bhagavatam, this is the definition of greatness. Greatness is not just about what we apparently achieve in this world. Greatness is not about how many people um, recognize what we have achieved in this world. Greatness is in how we respond to difficult circumstances. Do we respond with integrity? Do we respond by, I'm being exploited, so let me exploit? That's the most common instinctive reaction to the false ego. But greatness is rising above the false ego. And greatness is ultimately how God within our heart is observing the choices we make in our life. In a world where it seems like things are just so beyond our control, I can't make any difference anyway. By using that excuse to just go along with the wrongdoings, that, that's not greatness. But however big or however small, the example we were using yesterday, whether Nityananda Prabhu is pouring wonderful Ganges water on Lord Chaitanya during the Maha Abhishek, or whether Duki Suki, who nobody even sees, is just going and gathering some water to give to somebody, to give to somebody, to give to somebody. Lord Chaitanya recognized her greatness. 
And today, 500 years later, how many um, wealthy, powerful landowners and scholars and everything, everybody lived between now and 500 years ago? But with tears in our eyes being transformed in our hearts, we're remembering Suki. Lord Chaitanya glorified her because of her greatness and also glorified the great scholars and the very powerful leaders of society who had that same greatness. So these cars, the interior of the cars, the mind, the intelligence, and the exterior of the car, um, you know, the, the senses, the organs, they're all assembled by nature. And what does satsang mean? Satsang means that human beings who are truly aspiring to know God, to love God, and to live in harmony with the goodness of, this, of God's love in this world, we assemble together. And we inspire each other through hearing this transcendental knowledge, this wisdom, these pastimes, by chanting God's names together. Why? so that our hearts can be pure, purified, and then we apply those principles to the way that we live. When these, when these wonderful souls were cleaning the floors and cleaning all the places between the cracks of the wood to try to yet somehow or other extract our flower petals and scrubbing the floors and everything like that. The doors to the altar were closed. When we were celebrating, Krishna was looking at us. But Krishna is always looking at us. The door is open so that we get a consciousness that actually Krishna is always looking at us. <laughs> it's not when the door is open we think, now Krishna is looking at us. <laughs> but we don't recognize that Krishna is looking at us. So the door opens, so yes, actually, he's looking at us. <laughs> and the door is never closed. <laughs> as far as Krishna's perception. So these are teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. And today is a very holy day in our calendar. Uh, it is the disappearance day of Devananda Pandit. I would like to share, briefly share this one aspect of his life, which was orchestrated in such a way to teach us one of the most important lessons of life, which are very much um, at the very heart of the verse we're reading today. Devananda Pandit was among the greatest scholars in the world. He was so pious and very, very austere. From an external perception, he was simply an extraordinary human being. He lived with the same austere, renounced principles as a sannyasi, a swami. 
And the single scripture he would teach from was the Srimad Bhagavatam. The crest jewel of all Vedic literatures. And how he could speak. And the extreme eloquence in which he could dissect each Sanskrit word and explain it in ways that were spellbinding. He was considered in Navadweep, which was the high seat of learning for all of India at this time. He was considered the greatest scholar of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And one of the greatest scholars of anything. He had a large devoted following. But it doesn't mean he didn't have ego. He actually behaved in a very humble, respectful, cultured way. But there's pride in that too sometimes. And he was seeing the whole teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam and he could speak it and speak it and speak it as the path to liberation. He could not understand that the whole purpose of Srimad Bhagavatam is to bring us beyond liberation. Dharma Parochita Kaita Bhopa. It's meant to awaken from within our hearts pure, unmotivated, uninterrupted love for God, for Krishna. That's his only purpose. He knew everything about the Bhagavatam except his purpose. <laughs> and he was so influential that he was teaching everybody else everything about the Bhagavatam except the purpose. So this is how it was being spread. One day, he's teaching among his very senior students. <coughs> Today, in our verse, the first word is O Narada. Well, 500 years ago, the same Narada, he incarnated as Srivas Thakur who was such a great devotee. Of course, Narada Muni, he's guru of Prahlad and Dhruva and Valmiki and so many souls. Vyasdev, the author of Vedas. But in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, that same Narada is taking a, a very, very humble role as a devotee. He's a married man. His wife is equal to him in every way, Malini, in her devotion. He had a son. So even though he's Narada Muni, Narada Muni is a Swami that's just traveling around everywhere. And now here he is, living in a little house <laughs> with a family. <laughs> and he loved Krishna. He was, it, this story we're telling, as far as we have reference to, it's taking place even before Lord Chaitanya appeared in the world. Shivas Thakur is walking, and he walks by the school where Devananda Pandit is speaking from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And everybody's in rapt attention, in silence. And Srivas is so attracted to him. But he was hearing something totally different than what everybody else was hearing, even though it was the same words. Because our consciousness is like a filter. 
And our ego is like a filter, whatever comes in, it's colored by the nature of our desires and our fears and our conditionings. And the idea of as it is, I mean, there's no, there's no filter of conditioned ego. We just hear what's there. So Srivas is hearing, Devananda Pandit explain, and all the students are hearing it one way, and he's hearing something completely different. He's hearing something completely different from what Devananda Pandit is even intending to say while he's saying it. <coughs> and he was feeling Srimad Bhagavatam. Every word is a precious offering of love to Krishna. Every word is Krishna. The culmination of Srimad Bhagavatam is Sri Radha's love for Krishna. How Krishna becomes subordinate to his to the feminine aspect of the Supreme Sri Radha because of her overloving well, overwhelming love. This is what Srivas is hearing. And he started to cry. The students of Devananda Pandit were thinking they were great scholars. What is this sentimental person? We are hearing philosophy and he's crying. He simply, get him out of here, worthless. And they actually lifted up and took him outside and threw him outside. And Devananda Pandit, the teacher, is watching and seeing everything, and he just let it happen. He didn't really see much. Yeah, get him out, let him go. He doesn't understand. <coughs> Meanwhile, after some time, Srivas is outside, and he finds where, you know, he was like in a trance. He wasn't crying on purpose. And he's, he understood exactly what was happening. And in his humility, he was ashamed. Why I create a disturbance and why, you know, they just kicked me out like this. And he just, very sadly by everything that happened, he went home to his wife and family. And, the other devotees, there were just a few. Krishna's in everyone's heart, and he sees everything. And the beautiful thing, Vedam samatitani varadamanani chaudrana babashani tibhutani mam tu vedana kashtana. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, I am I'm seated in the heart of every living being. I know everything that's happened in the past. I know all things that are happening in the present. And I know whatever's going to happen in the future. I know every living being completely. But no one can meet but no one can know me in full. That's who's living in your heart. That makes your heart a very special place, very special guest. Actually, we're the guest. <laughs> the Lord is the proprietor of our heart. <laughs> Can you imagine having a roommate like that? <laughs> That's how fortunate we are. The more we're conscious of, of, of God's presence, the more we really live in ecstasy. This is who I'm always with. This who's inside of me. In fact, this is who's inside everybody. 
what a wonderful flower festival life will be if we just recognize that. But still, you have to clean up after the funeral. <laughs> as, as long as we're in this world. <laughs> but that becomes, that becomes actually one of the best parts of the festival. <laughs> because we're recognizing what a wonderful opportunity it is. And I heard the devotees when they're cleaning up, they're thinking of ways that we can clean up more efficiently next year. <laughs> it's very dynamic. So, Sri Thakur, you know, he's, he's broken hearted, he's ashamed, he goes home. Devananda Pandit just carries on with his teachings. He really couldn't care less. His students are just happy they got rid of this person. But the Lord within the heart. Years later, after Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned from Gaya and established the Sankirtan movement, he was walking with his devotees. This is in Navadweep, the place where Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's father's house was, Mahesh um, Visharada, was in an area, Vidyanagar, and close to that is Kuladweep, or Kuliagram. So Lord Chaitanya was walking with some of his associates, including Sribas. And he heard from the school, Devananda Pandit, he had a very, very eloquent, beautiful voice when he narrated. And he was speaking in his spellbinding ways the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam, and all the students were listening, so grateful. And here's Nimai, Lord Goranga, he hears it. He becomes angry as fire. He calls out, what right do you have, you rascal, to speak Srimad Bhagavatam? You are simply misrepresenting everything. And you're misleading everyone. Now here's a person who's known for his piety, for his renunciation, for his knowledge, and Lord Chaitanya speaking like this. He said, you do not understand what is devotion, what is love. On this very day, I am going to rip your Srimad Bhagavatam to pieces. And Lord Chaitanya ran to do that. And Srivas and the other devotee said, look, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so they left. But Devananda Pandit heard and saw all this. He didn't understand that Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself, the very goal of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the very author of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna tells in Gita, I am the author of the Vedas, I'm the knower of the Vedas, and by all the Vedas I'm to be known. Veda means knowledge. So he could not recognize but he was disturbed that this Nimai Pandit was speaking so harshly about him. And another time, Devananda Pandit was walking down the road with some of his followers, and Lord Chaitanya saw him. 
and said, how dare you speak Srimad Bhagavatam and you commit offense? You disrespect and abuse Srivas, who's the very embodiment of the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam? Shame upon your hypocrisy. Devananda Pandit listened, but somehow it didn't penetrate him because he just, not only did he know so much, but everybody around him was glorifying and reconfirming how much he knew. After some time, Lord Chaitanya left Navadweep forever to become a sannyasi. And this really struck the hearts of people. He was so beautiful, so kind, so merciful, so learned, so everything divine. And now he left us, he left his home to live as a mendicant. It, it created a, a, a great trauma within Navadweep. And one day, a particular devotee of Lord Chaitanya, everybody knows his name. Please say it loud. See, I'm telling a story they already know. <laughs> but the more we hear it, the more we have an opportunity to actually be transformed. Vakreshwar Pandit was such a devotee of the Lord. During Lord Chaitanya's pastimes in Navadweep, he was there at the house of Srivas chanting, and at one time it is described Lord Chaitanya was singing Krishna's holy names, and Vakreshwar Pandit was dancing nonstop for 72 consecutive hours. And as he was dancing, Lord Chaitanya was becoming more inspired to chant, and they were both dancing and singing together for 72 hours. They didn't stop for prasad. <laughs> They didn't stop um, to rest. As far as we know, they didn't even stop to go to the bathroom. <laughs> that was their total absorption in tasting the sweetness of love of Krishna chanting, dancing. Lord Chaitanya loved Vakreshwar Pandit. He was so pure. He was so compassionate. One day, Vakreshwar Pandit came to the area where Devananda Pandit was teaching, in Kuliagram. And there, he was just himself. He was inspiring the villagers to have kirtan. He began to chant and they were chanting with him, and he was dancing. He danced so beautiful, so gracefully, because it was, you know, every limb of his body was simply an expression of his soul's love. This is the essence of what kirtan is. It's not just a dance. In this world, there are so many dance steps <laughs> that you could learn. Yes, you know, in different generations, there's different dance steps. <laughs> and every generation thinks the, the next generation is going crazy. <laughs> but that's what our parents said about us, too. And that's what their parents said about them. So th things are always evolving as far as dance steps. <laughs> but kirtan is not... Yes, it's old. 
<laughs> Lord Chaitanya was doing it 500 years ago. And, and, and in Goloka Vrindavan, in the spiritual world, they're dancing the same way forever. But what is this dance? When we understand our mind, our body, our senses, our everything is Krishna's property. And this doesn't mean that I'm a slave because nothing is mine. It means we're actually an Ananda, real ecstasy, real spiritual happiness is according to how much we realize everything is to be offered with love. So the way Lord Chaitanya and Vakreshwar Pandit were dancing, every movement of their finger was an offering of ecstatic love for Krishna, offering of an ecstatic compassion to inspire others to love Krishna. We cannot imitate. But when we actually have this pure state of heart, that's what dancing and singing is. It's a musical performance that is actually an expression of ecstatic love and an offering of the highest charity and blessing for all beings. That's what kirtan is meant to be. So Vakreshwar Pandit is dancing with so much compassion, so much devotion. Devananda Pandit, he's pious, he's cultured, he's learned, he's renounced. But nothing ever really penetrated his, his heart to reach his soul. But when he saw the compassion, the kindness, and the love of Vakreshwar Pandit, and he saw crowds of people coming around, something happened. He wanted to help. He wanted to serve. Vakreshwar is dancing, and people are crowding around him, and Devananda Pandit is a very elderly person. He was keeping everyone a, a, a nice, respectful distance so that Vakreshwar Pandit could dance to his heart's content. Because he appreciated this devotee with a will to serve, his mind and his heart opened. His heart was becoming transformed. And when Vakreshwar pondered after, I believe it was, he was chanting and dancing for six hours. And Devananda Pandit was just trying to do some service according to his influence and compassion. Afterward, when Vakreshwar Pandit seemed to be tired to rest, Devananda Pandit ran to him, prostrated himself to offer obeisances in great appreciation. Such a great soul. Such a compassionate, saintly person this is. And he began to massage Vakreshwar Pandit's <laughs> legs because he was dancing so long. And there was dust on Vakreshwar's body, so Devananda was whisking the dust off. He was rendering service with great appreciation. And Vakreshwar Pandit was so kind. He said, may you be blessed with love for Krishna. And you know what happened? At that moment, Devananda Pandit started experiencing something he never did before. 
His whole life he was teaching Srimad Bhagavatam, and the only thing Srimad Bhagavatam teaches is how to love Krishna. But when he heard this from Vakarishwar Pandit, it was the first time he understood what love for Krishna is. And then he understood, through Vakreshwar Pandit's association, who is Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's actually the avatar of this age of Kali. Krishna comes with the Mahabhava of Sri Radha to distribute the love of Sri Vrindavan, the deepest state of ecstatic love. And I have been offensive to him, neglectful to him. So years later, after Lord Chaitanya Sannyasi, he by his own free will, he comes back to Navadweep. And he comes to Kuliagram. And now Devananda Pandit is a completely transformed person. But he's feeling so guilty for his offenses. Just before him, actually this was a place that all sorts of people who did all sorts of things that were unfavorable in every way for their spiritual lives, they came to beg forgiveness. And Lord Chaitanya was forgiving everyone and giving them ecstatic love. One Brahmin, very learned person from a very prestigious family, he was crying. He said, I could not understand who you are. I could not understand who your devotees are. I could not understand what the holy name of Krishna is. I was thinking, who are these people who are, who are chanting God's names in this age of Kali? They cannot be saintly. I was criticizing them. But now I understand the defect was in me. What am I supposed to do? Lord Chaitanya gave an eternal instruction. He said, with your mouth, if you drink poison, that poison will make you very ill. But with the same mouth, if you drink nectar, the nectar will neutralize and purify the poison and give you all good health and happiness. So similarly, with the same mouth that you tasted the poison of criticizing others, now use that to chant the nectar of God's holy names. But that alone will not work. Not only must you chant God's names, but chant the glories of those who love God. And very soon you will taste nectar. Devananda Pandit was watching and listening. He was so ashamed. He was afraid to even come before the Lord, but Lord Chaitanya saw him from a distant place. He said, oh, Devananda, I see you. You have rendered service to Vakreshwar. Therefore, you please come. And Lord Chaitanya, tasting the nectar of the love for his devotee, he was saying, Vakreshwar Pandit, his love for Krishna, his compassion for all living beings is so great, and you received his mercy. Not only that, you served him and you pleased him. Krishna is always residing in the heart of Vakreshwar Pandit, and Vakreshwar Pandit is always residing in the heart of Krishna. Wherever Vakreshwar Pandit sings and dances, 
Krishna is in that place singing and dancing. Wherever Vakreshwar Pandit is, all the holy places of pilgrimage are accessible at that time. And then, Lord Chaitanya explained, there are two, there are two forms of Srimad Bhagavatam. There is the book Bhagavatam, and there is the person Bhagavatam. And you cannot understand one without the other. The book Bhagavatam is the words, which are the essence of all the Vedic knowledge. Lord Chaitanya told Devananda Pandit that Vyasadeva, who compiled all the four Vedas, the Upanishads, the Itihastas, the Mahabharata, he did all of these literatures and Samhitas, he was still dissatisfied. I haven't given everything. And then it was Narada Modi who told him, give the world the literature that is exclusively revealing Sri Radha's love for Krishna and pure devotional service. And that is Srimad Bhagavatam. But we cannot understand the book Bhagavatam unless we offer service and appreciation for those who are following the person Bhagavatam. In fact, Srimad Bhagavatam itself, it describes Shushusho Shudatanasya Vasudeva Kataruchi Syan Mahatsevaya Viprapundya Tirtana Sevana. By rendering service to the person Bhagavat, one develops an actual taste for hearing the book Bhagavatam. And through that process of seva to the Lord's devotees and hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, the heart becomes purified. And in this way, love for God, love for Krishna is given to us. Shrinvatam Sukata Krishna. Because Krishna is pleased. Love of God can never be achieved, it can never be attained. You cannot buy it, you cannot learn it. Love of God is a gift, it's given. When Krishna is pleased by the sincerity of how we're taking shelter and how we're living. And most of all, how we're dealing with each other and inspiring one another. So Devananda Pandit becomes, became such a saint. And Lord Chaitanya concluded by saying, whatever blessings you have by now understanding ecstatic love for Krishna, is because you have served Vakreshwar Pandit. Now you speak Srimad Bhagavatam in such a way that every verse and every word and every syllable is leading people toward ecstatic love for Krishna. But you must go to Srivas and you must get his forgiveness for what you did so many long years ago. And Srivas, when he came to Srivas so sincerely, Srivas totally forgot all about all these things. He really couldn't care less. <laughs> he just embraced him and cried in, in, in ecstatic compassion and just showered his, his, his his feelings of affection upon Devananda Pandit. And here it is 500 years later, we are celebrating the life of Devananda Pandit. 
and all the wonderful lessons that we learned through his mistakes and through the grace of the lovers of God, how he, is, how he was able to choose to rectify those mistakes. Not just with negativity, but by filling his heart with enthusiasm to serve. As I was speaking these words, I was remembering our very esteemed worshipable God sister Yamuna Devi and her life. Um, there are volumes and volumes of books and perhaps in the future Puranas which <laughs> describe the glories of her life. She was, as little children, she was classmates with Shama Sundar Prabhu. But at that time, you know, they were Sam and Joan or something. <laughs> and they were playful children, but somehow or other, she always had this, this seeking for something very deep and very genuine and very pure. And in 1966, her younger sister was getting married. Her younger sister had just been initiated. Her name was Janaki. And her husband, her husband was Mukunda, now Goswami Maharaj. And when they were getting married in 1966 in New York, actually Srila Prabhupada lived with Janaki and Mukunda in a little tiny flat in the Bowery of New York City. And they helped Srila Prabhupada because he was homeless at the time. They helped him get a little tiny storefront in the East Village. Very small. Um, that little room where all the um, illustrious ladies make garlands and everything, it probably one third the size of that was the storefront. 26 Second Avenue. It was a very rundown neighborhood at the time. And Srila Prabhupada had a little apartment he lived in just behind the storefront. So now, his first disciples, Janaki and Mukunda, they're getting married. And in India, marriages are quite serious um, events. <laughs> So, and especially in Bengal, there are very, very joyous occasions. Everybody comes. So Prabhupada told Mukunda and Janaki, we will have a marriage. All, all they had is this little storefront. He said, invite your families. And he was thinking of so many people coming. <laughs> but from both families, the only person that came was Janaki's older sister. And she came all the way from Salem, Oregon, to the Lower East Side of New York City, just to be there for her sister. And Srila Prabhupada was all alone cooking for the whole feast, for everybody, whoever was going to come. So Jamuna asked, at that time, she didn't have that name, she asked, Swamiji, can I help you? And Prabhupada brought her in a little apartment and they were cooking. He was teaching her cooking. And 
And just that time with Sri the person Bhagavatam, serving, because she came to serve. Her heart was so open, she could fully appreciate who Sri Prabhupada was, what he was giving. When she returned later to San Francisco, and she became a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. She was so expert at everything because everything she did was with such feeling. She was a person Bhagavatam. Why did she do everything? When she wrote, she was a calligrapher. She was a master chef. She was an interior designer. She had the most beautiful voice of singing and playing instruments. She, everything she did, she was doing it so consciously as an act of gratitude and devotion to Srila Prabhupada. That's why she actually put her heart and soul into everything. Every morning we hear, hear her singing when the doors of the altar open. A recording. One Swami, I believe, in the renounced order, he said, Bro, why are we listening to ladies singing when Prabhupada said, this is not lady or man singing. This is a symphony of devotion and love. <laughs> As they say, it takes one to know one. <laughs> yes. You know, if we want to understand the beauty, the sweetness, and the, 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 the ecstatic joy of surrender, Yamuna Devi, just listen to her voice. See how she decorates her deities. Just cheerfulness, the joyfulness, and the gravity of her personality was an extraordinary life-changing experience. In fact, when I first came to Mumbai, actually before that, in 1969, you know, she was cooking a beautiful f feast of prasad with it, and with her sister and Malati Devi and Shama Sundar and Mukunda invited George Harrison to come for this prasad. And at this time, you know, he was still in the Beatles. So a very famous person. And he came to this little loft where the devotees were living. It was the first time they actually had a place to live together. Somebody allowed them to stay in you know, between tenants. <laughs> and when he was giving prasad, when, when she gave prasad to him, George said, I love your singing. And she said, how do you know my singing? Because this is before any recordings or anything. He said, you, you're going to little nightclubs and singing, and I disguise myself just to come and hear you sing. No, nope. nobody knew he was coming. They were just going to any little club that allowed them to come to sing Hare Krishna mantra and kirtan. And he was so moved by the devotion and the skills, he was disguising himself to hear her. And he said, I want, I want to help you make a record. And they made a record at Apple Studios, and she was the main singer for this record. In fact, when she chanted the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, it became the number one song in most all of Europe and England. Uh, 
I remember once in the mid 80s, I was driving in the middle of the night between one college lecture and another one, and I was all alone, and I was thinking, I'll never forget this, it's, it's a foolish story, please forgive me for telling. <laughs> I was thinking how to stay awake, but I have to be there in the morning for this lecture. And in those days, there were these you know, radios where you turn the dial. And I was using somebody else's vehicle. So I just turned the dial to see what, maybe something will keep me awake. And as soon as I turned the dial, I turned on the radio, AM radio, it was Yamuna Devi singing the Hare Krishna mantra. And I was thinking, this is where I'm supposed to be, definitely. And as soon as it ended, I turned it off because it was. <laughs> I didn't want. I didn't want to mix up that experience. <laughs> And she came to India, and when the first day I met devotees, just a few minutes from here at Kuras Maidan, I came in and I sat down in this park, and while I came in, she was sitting all alone on the stage chanting. And I remember thinking, who is this person? What is the nature of this? the depth of her devotion and her love. And you, could, you could hear in her voice there was such a gravity of wisdom and a, such a sweetness of, of, of bhava, of devotion. And she became traveling with Srila Prabhupada and personally, she was personally cooking for him. And she helped to establish the temple in Vrindavan, Krishna Balaram, Radhasham Sundar Temple. And I remember um, at the end of my stay in Vrindavan, after I came back actually from Nepal, her and Guru Das, who was her husband, they were living at the Radha Damodar temple. And I would come to visit them sometime because there was no other Westerners in Vrindavan at the time. They were just staying just upstairs from Srila Prabhupada's rooms and they were always talking about serving Srila Prabhupada. And I was thinking their love for their guru is so deep and so great. I felt totally insignificant. And she used to tell a story which was very similar to what we've been discussing today and yesterday evening. When she was living at Radha Damodar, there was, here she is, so cultured, so refined, so incredibly well educated and eloquent in everything she does and while she was living in Vrindavan at that time there was this very simple uneducated Bengali widow who just wore you know she just had a white sheet she just kind of wrapped around herself like a sari that's all she had and every morning early morning, while Radha Damodar's doors were closed and they were being bathed, she would come with a pot of water from the Yamuna. And nobody even knew who she was. She would just leave that water just outside the door. And it was always there. So the Pujaris would just come out and see the water and use it for serving Radha Damodar on the altar. But Yamuna would see this every day. She didn't say anything. She was just quietly chanting to herself, putting that water and going away. And Yamuna Devi, she wanted to become like this old Bengali widow. 
such devotion. You see, when you're actually saragrahi, when you're actually seeking the essence, then you really take note of where there's sincere love, where there's sincere devotion, where there's sincere compassion, where there's actually this selfish spirit of loving service. And for the rest of her life, she would talk about this Bengali widow. She even got to know her. She didn't speak English, but somehow or other they communicated. We can understand the infinite knowledge, wisdom, and sweetness of the Srimad Bhagavatam as the literary incarnation of Krishna. It is described in Srimad Bhagavatam that when Krishna left this world, he incarnated in the form of this book, the Srimad Bhagavatam. But it is all, the truth of it is only accessible when Krishna bestows his mercy upon us from within our hearts. And that mercy is only accessible when Krishna sees that we're honoring, respecting, and eager to serve those who embody the principles of Srimad Bhagavatam. Is there any questions? Yes, Merle Dar. Merle Dar is a is a dentist. <laughs> but he's become a transcendentalist. <laughs> From dental to transcendental. <laughs> but last, last week I had to really remember that because he pulled out two of my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of, by his association, I became transcendental. <laughs> Thank you for a very wonderful class. <coughs> when you're speaking about that story of uh, Devanand Pandit, uh, just a thought came, how it is difficult for us to understand who is advanced and who is not advanced, especially when we are in the association of Vaishnavas. Unless until we don't interact with them on a regular basis, we will not know also. That also is difficult when you're associated with them um, externally, yes, we know, okay, the way if we are doing some services with them, we will come to know. Otherwise, very difficult for us to know who is advanced and who is not advanced. And more so when we are in the managerial position, we take some decisions. Uh, we will not be able to find out especially whether we are offending some Vaishnavas or not. Because some decisions may have to be taken which may be little tough decisions and that time we may hurt someone, we may offend someone, Maharaj. I just want to know from you how do we remain vigilant <clears throat> and at the same time be sensitive not to commit offenses this time. Lord Chaitanya has given us this principle, Amani Namani Dena. We should actually be respectful to every living being. And where someone is teaching us the proper understanding of transcendental knowledge and lifestyle, then we follow. Um, we may not know how advanced they are. 
that may not be something that we can understand. But we respect and honor people and, um, and we follow those who are actually delivering transcendental knowledge. And then Krishna's pleased with us. As far as managerially, if you're offensive, if you're envious, and you treat somebody accordingly, whether they're advanced or whether they're not advanced, you're going to have to pay a serious price. So if somebody's put under our charge, um, then you know we should we should nourish them like a like a mother or f father would nourish their children and try to help them. And if we have to chastise them, it should be for honestly and earnestly for their benefit, not simply out of anger or spite or envy or carelessness. But through understanding the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, we, we understand what it means to be an advanced devotee. And we are eager to serve such, such persons. But in essence, we're eager to serve everybody according to their capacity. So we need to be sincere. If we're thinking, let me only serve those who are completely pure in heart, then we'll be doing disservice to those who are completely pure in heart. Let us use example of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada may have he, he was completely pure in heart. But if we're fighting with one another or abusing one another, no matter how much we try to please him and follow him, we're not pleasing him and following him. How we treat each other is very much how we're treating our gurus. So to understand what is spiritual advancement, you know, we we have um, we have the instructions and the examples of great souls, but ultimately the real understanding comes when by our sincerity, Krishna gives us that understanding from within. So be sincere. And feel Amani uh, Namanate now. This is not a detail, this is an exalted principle. To strive to be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant and forgiving like a tree, to offer all respect to others and not expect or demand respect from oneself. And Krishna's pleased with us and he will reveal himself in his holy names. And we can chant constantly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Is there one, one more question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my ambrosis. Was, uh, in the storyline where she was Thakur is offended by Devanand Pandit was he. But Devanand Pandit was not intentionally doing anything. It is just happened because he he couldn't recognize the devotion of Shiva Thakur Prabhu. In day to day activities we we how we come to know that we offended someone because 
Lord Chaitanya is the Supreme Lord that He could understand from the heart. But we are ignorant, conditioned living entities, how we can understand, how we offended a great soul and how to rectify that later on because we don't know whom we have offended by our immature way and all conditionings and how we can rectify that mistake, Maharaj. Yes, Devananda Pandit could not recognize who Srivats was, as Murlidhar was saying, but still, he was a great devotee. <laughs> And he was being abused. And Devananda Pandit allowed it to happen. He willingly, not unintentionally, he willingly stood by and watched it happen. And he could have done something, but he didn't. It wasn't something that just happened unknowingly. It happened very knowingly. And here, a person who he could not recognize was being offended. But yet, how much it angered the Lord in his heart because that person was so dear to him. So we have to be very careful. We may not recognize sometimes who a great devotee really is. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada would say, you don't know who you're living with. They may not even be manifesting according to what we can recognize. I've seen where people were very senior devotees were very um, harsh on somebody who made mistakes due to some spiritual weaknesses. And Srila Prabhupada was like fire, not on the person with the spiritual weakness, but with the so-called advanced people who was being harsh with him. Why are you breaking his spirit? Why are you finding this false? So we have to be very careful. Yes, Devananda Pandit could not recognize who Srivas was, but he was allowing and participating in harshness to an innocent soul, not knowing that actually he is a great soul. And that's actually a lesson we have to learn. We may not know who we're dealing with. Hari Hari. So the safe thing is, unless we really need to be corrective in everything, we should be honoring and respecting every living entity. We're taught in the scriptures, if we disrespect unnecessarily, even an insect, we have to suffer. Now, insects are not person Bhagavatams. <laughs> huh? You know why we honor and respect animals? In the West, you know, if you kick somebody's dog, you really become the enemy of somebody. Why? Because this is my dog. They have feelings and you've heard it. Well, infinitely more than you may love your dog, God loves everybody. So if you cause unnecessary harm to anybody, Krishna, in your heart, why you're kicking my dogs. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but we have to. <laughs> That's what yoga means, to be aware, to be conscious, not to cause harm to others.
Hari Hari. If you allow Maharaj, just subscribe. Huh? Small question leading to this. When you are in a positions of you know correcting others, and that time you cannot live in a fear of uh, anxiety of offending others. Like many times, but that time we are not so uh, spiritually advanced also like or more mental conditioning. In such situations, neither we can you know live in a consciousness. We, he will get offended. He will get offended. The work has to be also completed. So in that situations, yes, we will work on our conditionings. That's okay, but. What will be the guideline for those who are in positions where they have been given the position to do mm-hmm. the things? They have been responsible for doing the work and work has to be completed. You have to be correct someone to get it done. We can correct for the benefit of somebody, not because of the anger of our own or the arrogance of our own ego. A Vaishnav corrects to uplift not to push down. And we should be very careful about correcting only when it's actually really needed. And it's meant to uplift. That's sincerity. Thank you, Mark. Very well. Thank you. Whatever you're saying is meant for me to learn. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but I was told that breakfast is at 11 o'clock, so we're... (laughs) So I I wanted to somehow keep you busy until that auspicious moment came. And we could have kirtan for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanamini Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharini Nirbhishesha Shunyavadi Vastata Deshata Shri Krishna Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adaita Kadadhar Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hari Hari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna
Hari Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari.
Hadi Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hadi Rama Hadi Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai Jai Prabhupada, 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 Prabhupada. Nithai Go Hadi Go, Hadi Go, Hadi Go, Hadi Go. Hadipo, 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 Hadipo. Radha Kopi Nata Radha Kopi Nata Radha. Radha Gopinatha Radha Gopinatha Radha 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 Gopinatha Radha Gopinatha Radha Kripa Sindhu Pya Eva Cha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namam Namam Hare Krishna very much. Hare Krishna, request all the devotees to please be seated. Hare Krishna, Kripya Bhai Jaiye, Apeya, Jagape. Hare Krishna, request everyone to please maintain silence.
Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for this wonderful class, Ecstatic Kirtan. We'll just wait for one minute for Maharaj to come back. <laughs>